and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'd like to start out with public participation. If anyone had any comments, please come up and do it now. I'm Sarah Pilling from Garrett Hill, but also the co-coordinator for the Skunk Hollow Community Garden. I want to let you know that all our plots are asked for. We had our first meeting on the 18th at the library. There were over 60 people there. The enthusiasm and the energy is really quite extraordinary. We haven't gotten all the spouses and all the kids' names yet, but we suspect there are going to be nearly 100 people working in the garden this summer. And our first work day is this Saturday. We'll be working every Saturday in March to get the garden ready and hope to be planting by the 1st of April. When we have a complete list, we will submit it to the commissioners so you can see name and address of everybody who's participating. We only had one request from outside the township, and that was in Lower Marion because Haverford College, very sadly, is getting rid of their garden in favor of a parking lot for the U.S. Open in 2013. She was very upset that she couldn't join us, but we said, you know, we're sorry. It's a Radnor Township. So we're on our way, and we're really very excited about it, and I wanted to let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Next item on the agenda is a notice of executive session preceding the Board of Commissioners meeting this evening, February 27th. We discussed personnel and litigation matters, and all seven commissioners were present. Can I have a motion to accept departmental reports? I motion we accept the departmental reports. Second. Any commissioners have any questions? A real quick question. Steve, when I noticed that it reports that Doug had done some markouts for property resale, do we get paid for those? Doug does the inspection, the sidewalk inspection, and the uh, looks for illicit sump pump inspections. Um, I do not believe there's a fee charge for that. For what? For that inspection. Yeah. When you go into a house, we, you pay $150. It's an occupancy fee. No, this is when you're selling a house before you, you sell it. Before you sell it, you get a CFO, and you pay $150 for that CFO, and we go check your sidewalks, and we check whether some pump is connected illegally. Right. So we're okay. And also, I think there's, they check the, for 9-11, 911, the size of the letters on the house. I didn't yeah, know letters that on, was Yeah, letters on the house, and we have to have sign an affidavit to smoke detectors in every bedroom and every level of the house. And that's why the fee is uh, $150 okay. to cover Thanks. that cost. Thank you. Any member of the public have anything on uh, departmental reports? All the commissioners in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Pass the seven to zero. Now we have a presentation from the Wayne Business Association. Good evening. I'm Diane Girolli, president of the Wayne Business Association. Thank you for having us here tonight. And um, I just want to address the commissioners and the community and let them know that we're still on board for all of our four usual events that the Wayne Business Association produces. And um, I brought with me the committee chairs for the um, spring events coming up. And we're going to start with the Wayne Cleanup Day, which is Saturday, May 19th. And with, with us, the chairperson is Jack Brooks. Good evening. We had a very successful Wayne Cleanup Day last year. We had cadets from uh, Valley Forge Military Academy come and help clean up the streets. This event is uh, I'll move the poster over. There. Um, the, this event is the Saturday before the Memorial Day Parade, and the idea is to help clean up the streets in Wayne and make it look fantastic for our wonderful Memorial Day Parade. We're looking this year to expand a little bit more and get students from other schools that are interested in doing a community service project. We'll assemble on that Saturday morning at 9 o'clock right at the War Memorial in downtown Wayne. We'll spread out. We have bags and shirts for people to wear and clean up the streets. And then we'll finish up and reassemble in front of Christopher's Restaurant where they'll have hot dogs and beverages and we'll be done by noon. So it's a 9 to noon event. It's a very fast event, but I think it's a great one for kids to get involved in the community and any adults that want to come out as well and help pick it up. We do encourage the merchants to be mindful that the parade will be the following week and to make sure that they spruce up the streets in downtown Wayne as well. 
Thank you, Jack. And now I have um, Chris Todd from Christopher's to help uh, talk about the Jazz Fest. Hello, Commissioners. Good evening. Hey, yeah, the Jazz Fest, I think it's uh, going in the eighth year. Um, it's a great event in Wayne, brings a lot of attention to the town. Uh, we always appreciate uh, Radnor's participation with uh, trash removal and, and fees and that sort of thing. Um, it's also a great uh, avenue for the mer local merchants and everything to advertise their goods on the street as well. Uh, I think over, we usually average about five, 6,000 people to come through. Uh, great bands, good music, all that kind of fun stuff. So and after, in eight years, we've learned a lot. And I think we really have it uh, tweaked so it uh, runs very smoothly. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Did you uh, state the date? Yeah, the, uh, Saturday, June 12th, from 12 to, uh, 12 to 9. Chris is our new uh, Vice President for the Wayne Business Association. Thank you, Chris. And I'd like to thank the commissioners for all their support and, and the um, department's support as well, because without the, the support of the whole township, we couldn't be able to put on these events. And we think we've had enough practice now that we finally got them down pat. And our 17th year, at, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, 20th year for the Radnor Fall Festival is this year too, and that's coming in September. And then, of course, the Christmas events, November 30th and December 1st. And we haven't added anything. We haven't changed anything. We're going to keep the formats the same so the departments can expect the same expenses and, and uh, they know where to find me And if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Jim, Public Works and Engineering. You missed one, Bill. Oh, so, oh person, I'm sorry, personnel. We point to Labor Council. I'm sorry. All right, John. First item on the there is the resolution 2012-25 to appoint the, res, the Labor Council at a rate of a retainer of $1,800 a month. And, Bob, the hourly rate is at two ninety five. dollars That's correct. Okay. So I make a motion to approve. I second. Commissioners, have any question? Uh, Bob, Bob uh, I think one... one question here is there's no term on this resolution there's no expiration date I, I assume that council will serve at the pleasure of the Board of Commissioners that's correct and um, you might want to explain the difference between the hourly rate and the retainer sure the retainer covers a lot of the uh, staff time <coughs> questions regarding uh, personnel issues labor issues um, the only time that the hourly rate kicks in is when we would go to a full set either grievance hearing or any type of legal matters regarding personnel where the hourly rate, rate would go into effect. So the routine matters are covered by the $1,800 a month retainer. Correct. And the extraordinary matters are covered by an hourly rate. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And just so, every, so the public knows, our staff did a pretty rigorous analysis of what we paid last year and what these rates are and, and what the rates are in the market. And um, this particular um, situation has worked out very well for us. We've, we've made out well doing the retainer and the hourly above that. So, so I'm heartily in support of it. Do you remember the public have any comment? Um, all the commission favorites say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, everyone set in the zip. Next, we have um, Public Works and Engineering, Jim. There's a resolution, <clears throat> excuse me, 2012-14 uh, for the construction and, in, well, the installation of a fence, chain link fence at North Wayne Field. Um, we are choosing the lower bidder. We are proposing that we choose the lower bidder, which is ProMax Fence Systems. There is a memorandum, I think it's available to the public on the table over there, um, and it compares the bid by the low bid of 14322 by Promax, and you'll notice there's a very large contrast between that and two other bidders, Long, Fe Long Fence Company and Green Ridge Landscaping. And um, I talk with our Director of Public Works, those are accurate numbers, um, there's no error. Uh, we, originally asked for a bid to cover three discrete projects. We have now winnowed it down just to one project, and, and the ProMax number is uh, considerably lower for one project than the other two bidders' numbers are for um, one project as well. So I move the passage of Resolution 2012-14. Second. 
Commissioner, comment? I, I have a couple of questions. First one's, I guess, for John Rice. John, uh, I know what we're trying to approve, but the other two parks are mentioned in the title. Is that of any concern? No. Okay. No, that's fine. Steve, is line item one the North Wayne Field and two and three with the other two? That's correct. And the title, I didn't want to change that because that's how the bid actually okay. went out. Even though we're, you know, we always state we can award any, all or parts of any bid based on the discretion of the board. No, one, two and three are for the same fence, not for the other fences. It's just one fence that you have the low numbers here for. No, there was North Wayne, uh, St. David's You're looking community. at the memo, Bill, not the bid document. I think he oh, okay. probably delineated in the big, uh, bid documents no. line one, line two. All right, okay. Do you think it makes sense, John, to leave it in the title? I don't see any problem with it. I mean, you're only awarding the one fence bid. Well, can we take, is there a problem taking it out? You can take it out. All right. Do you mind I'll, I'll amend. David Park and Liberty Lane and just say the repair at North Wayne Park. Yeah, I'll amend the resolution. You'll orally. make a new resolution with those two taken out. With deletion from the title of a reference to St. David's Community Park and Liberty Lane. Yeah. And who's second? Lane's second. Second. Okay, any other comment? Any public comment? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. Public safety, Elaine? Yeah, first we, uh, I'll, move to accept. I'll move to accept the staff traffic committee meeting, meeting minutes from February 21st, 2012. Do I have a second? Do I have Se a second? I'll second, second. it. All right, who's second? Raise your hand. Jim second. Higgins. All right. <laughs> Jim got it. All right. Just make it easy. Jim Higgins, second. Any comments from the commissioners? Any public comment? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes seven to zero. Next, I will move to authorize the township solicitor to codify traffic ordinance, which I think we need a little background explanation. and ex explanation for. Um, what, what the proposal is, um, you have as you can imagine, stop signs, speed limits, parking ordinances that have been adopted uh, from the late 70s to the present. Um, there's an old 1977 handbook that has a lot of these ordinances in them. There was an attempt to update it in 07, which I just quite frankly found out about last week. Uh, you must have contracted with one of the code, uh, general code publishers. And there's a draft of that. So what I thought was a much more intense uh, effort is actually going to be a lot easier than what I thought since it was done, or at least there's a draft of it. Still going to have to be checked. But someone took all the traffic ordinances up to 07, so we have that. Um, what has to be done then, because the draft of that has a lot of handwritten changes in it that the police department have made over time. You don't have all your traffic ordinances as of today in one book easily identifiable. So what I'm proposing to do is you could send this to general code publishers and it would take months and I don't know what they would charge you, but I think I need about 20 to 25 hours uh, of time to take what was done up to 07 to verify with the police department that that was correct and then to take everything that's been done since 07 and put put that into this codified traffic ordinance put it on a disc so that every time you have a change in a parking area or you add a, a handicap space it that can be done very easily because what you have now is you have this draft and you have a lot of loose ordinances in a folder so it needs to be put into some kind of form so that the department and anyone else that might want to see the ordinances that implement it. And this covers all the streets in the township so um, do you in have one go, easy spot. You have to go through the minutes to get those ordinance changes? No, they're, no I have. They're pulled. Yeah, I, we have all the ordinances as far as I know. Okay. Um, and there was an effort made in 07 to codify this. I don't really know what happened with but I have at least that as a base document, and I have the 77 code when, when it was first done, and then I have everything that's been done since 07. So, so none of it's on e-code like the rest of our ordinances? <coughs> no. No. Okay. no. So 
my, my proposal is it's 20 to 25 hours at my general hourly rate. It's a special project, and it'll be done within the next 60 days. Um, I don't anticipate taking more time than John, that. John, am I time. correct that in our, we have the Radnor Code <clears throat> is divided into two basic sections, the administrative code and general legislation. Yeah. Am I correct that the traffic ordinances are not in general legislation? If they are, they have not been updated, as far as I know. No, that, um, I don't believe all well, of the traffic these. ordinances aren't in those two code books we have. I don't yeah, think. the two. They're not those two code books. The two, the two handbooks, Jim, and what's online. I don't believe any of the traffic ordinances are in there. From what I, and I've been through this with a couple members of the police department that have been here for a number of years. There's an old, tattered book from the late 70s, and then it was amended up until 07, and then there was an effort to codify it with general code, and I just found that out last week. So I have that, and then everything from 07 to the present, it hasn't been codified. But the two books that are the codes of Radnor Township <coughs> and the administration, they have all the zoning and uh, explain all the zoning and all. Department of Health. But they don't have the individual road by road approval for what the what the parking regulations are what the right. stop signs are so the, that'll be well, a this sounds point. like a very necessary project yeah. I, I can't imagine if you had to litigate the validity of one of our traffic ordinances that you have a, a tattered book that our good officers in the police department keep to, to, to not to on. give not to give any of the public any ideas no but right, well then don't but don't don't there don't, is don't. a there, there is another reason why this needs to be done is because you're going from meters to kiosks in certain of your lots and then that's got to be blended into this and we're going to do that also yeah. uh, so that the meter areas that you have now need to be changed those sections for these lots need to be changed so that we deal with kiosks and the department is able to enforce that new that Good. new system. Yeah. Just to be clear, all of those ordinances are in force. All we're doing is writing them down. Correct. So well, we're, pu we're, we're putting them in one spot right. yes. and we're going to make sure mm -hmm. that what's right. been repealed is no longer in the book mm -hmm. and what is new will be in a final one one spot. You'll be able to find the all the traffic ordinances. And will your work eventually end up on ECODE with the rest of our ordinances? I would expect so, yes. Okay. I don't, think, I don't think we got a second on that. You, you need Jimmy made the motion? Um, I'll second it. Okay. All right. Any other commissioner comment? Any public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Passes 7 to 0. Bill, before we leave um, public safety, I uh, just want to mention that tomorrow night public safety is having the deer control meeting at the Windsor room of the library it will not be in this building 7 p.m. in the Windsor room of the library and we'll be discussing our deer overpopulation and what we can, can do about it okay thank you John I make a motion to approve resolution 2012-26 authorizing the township to enter an agreement with science explorers for an after school science programming for winter and spring sessions. And this is another one of the uh, ones that we've encountered many of where the price can end up being more than 3,000. So therefore we need to approve by the board. Do I have a second? Second. Any other commissioner comment? Public comment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, I'd like to introduce resolution 2012 27, authorizing Township to enter into agreement with World Cup Sports Camp for four sessions of spring junior soccer programming. Once again, this is going to be over 3,000. Second? Second. Any comments from the commissioners? Public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Passed. And then resolution 2012-28 is authorizing the township to enter an agreement with the World Cup Sports Academy for spring break soccer camp. Again, this will be over the $3,000 limit. Do I have a second? Second. Commissioner comment? Public comment? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7 to 0. All. all right. Community development, Don? Sure. Uh, I move the resolution 
for the adoption of Ordinance 2012-01, amending Chapter 280 of the Radnor Township Code zoning by adding, adding definitions for bed and breakfast, a special exception, et cetera. Second? Second. Commissioner comment? Public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes seven to zero. And this next item is a caucus. So is there someone here that's going to give us a presentation on this? Yep. Mr. Bentley. You don't have the thing. He'll turn it up for you. Okay. Have faith. <clears throat> um, my name is Tom Bentley. I represent uh, Boathouse Realty, which is a division of Bentley Homes. Uh, we've been in Radnor Township and around Township, Radnor Township for the last 40 years. Um, we mostly build um, larger homes, but uh, we bought this parcel. It's uh, in your township. It's on County Line Road, R4. Um, we originally came in to um, meet with their staff, and we had what we thought was a buy right plan that had 16 lots on it. And uh, after talking with your staff and, and meeting with the Planning Commission, um, we whittled that down to 10 lots. Um, we had a number of meetings with the neighbors, um, probably about seven or eight meetings. Mr. Fisher was at two of those meetings. Um, we, um, we have a number of waivers, but the waivers are really all the result of um, what the Planning Commission has asked us to change and what the neighbors have asked us to change. And I think I did a good job satisfying the Planning Commission and the neighbors. And uh, this is what we have. It's um, the Planning Commission has approved it for prelim, prelim approval. And um, it's about as sure as I can make my presentation. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, have any questions or comments? Well, I do. I actually watched all those Planning Commission meetings. So um, I, I just want clarification on a couple of the um, of the waivers that were left a little unclear at the end. I, I mean, I don't want, we don't need to go through every waiver. There are a lot of waivers. But um, there were a few that at the end of the last Planning Commission meeting, I was still unclear really whether it had to be settled still or whether they had, you know, gone ahead and recommended having thought it was settled. So. Um, the first is the 500-foot survey. I, it, my understanding is that we ended up, or the, the recommendation ended up being a partial waiver. Is that yes. right? I mean, it's basically the same waiver we've granted for the mm -hmm. last couple land development applications where the applicant will work with Steve Narcini to provide the uh, required information on the plan. So yeah, it's a partial waiver, basically. And that'll be noted on the, on the plans? Correct, yes. Okay. Um, Next, all of the waivers that are requested in four through eight, those all have to do with kind of the reduction in size of the cul-de-sac, right? Yes, yeah, yeah it's the reduction in cul-de-sac and I guess the uh, elimination of sidewalk as well. Okay. And driveways. Okay. The. Um, Number 12, which the waiver would be, um, our, our ordinance says there shall be no drive, private driveways onto the direct access. The recommendation was to waive that. That one I wanted to, to hear from you, Dave, um, just to make me feel better that you feel that that's not, um, that's not dangerous. And, and for the next one, too, with the site distance. Those two waivers, I'd like to hear you confirm that you're comfortable with them. Yeah, I mean, we've taken a look at this, and the applicant, as well as our traffic engineer, has evaluated the site distance on County Line Road for these driveways. Mm -hmm. um, and there is adequate site distance. Uh, they, they have to do an analysis on, uh, I guess it's for lots four and five, the, the lots furthest to the, to the south, just to verify that they meet what's called the 85th percentile mm -hmm. uh, speed, but, but we, we're, we're sure they will meet that requirement. They're required to have 275 feet of uh, site distance per our ordinance. Per PennDOT, they're required to have 
I think it's 225, and, and they are providing that minimum site distance that's acceptable by PennDOT and is acceptable by our standards as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we do feel that the, uh, the site distance is, uh, is, is safe for, uh, for driveway access. Okay. She asked, she asked about the interior, the two interiors, or just the ones at the county line? Just on the county line. Okay. All right. Um, there was also discussion, I believe the, the applicant made um, the representation that the wall was being saved, right? That's correct. No, is that in the notes, or is, is that noted anywhere? It's, it's shown on the plan, and it will be shown on the final plan. Okay. You mean it just, it's drawn in on the plan? Just, yeah, it shows the wall. Can we make that a note, that, that it sure. will come down? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to just talk a little bit about the sidewalk. <laughs> Um, I've heard all that discussion, and I understand that the, and I'm mostly talking about the sidewalk on Lancaster because it didn't sound like anybody has an appetite for a sidewalk on county line or on the interior. Um, but what I took from the conversation in those planning commission meetings was that the planning commission would like to see the possibility of a sidewalk on Lancaster Avenue reserved, but that nothing needed to go into the documentation for that because there's already 14 or however many feet of right of way. That's correct. But the ordinance, if I understand it correctly, isn't just allowance of a sidewalk, it's provision of a sidewalk. Am I right about that? Right? So, um, and in other cases where we've done this and we've kind of said, well, it's not right for a sidewalk right now, but we want to keep the possibility, we've actually asked for that provision to go in escrow or to you know make some sort of arrangement for that because just having we don't even need permission we have the right of way and that is something I wanted to explore tonight how um, the applicant would feel about contributing to giving Radnor Township a check for fifty thousand dollars or something like that well uh, you know we could talk I'm not about crazy how much about it, it. <laughs> but I mean the ordinance that we're waiving doesn't just require the okay, I, it can go there. It requires you putting it in. And, and I, it sounds like it's a, not something any, that the neighbors want right now. And we well, all understand some of the that. neighbors really didn't want it. Right. Because, and, and there was a lot of talk about, you know, if you have a partial sidewalk up there and then above and below my property, um, it's a, a bank. Mm -hmm. So to have any kind of a sidewalk at all would really mm -hmm. encourage people to to walk in an unsafe area when cars are going by at, you know, 35, 40 miles an hour. And I think that, was, I mean, I think there was general consensus right. that right now it's not a good time. However, if we ever want it in the future, and we do want pedestrian friendly, especially around a university that's growing, then this would be the time to reserve it. And well, if you listen to their talk, they're not growing, they're just adding dorms. Right, well, okay. Yeah. Elaine, um, ex exactly where where is the um, location that we? Well, perhaps the applicant can point she's it She's talking out. about <coughs> along well, Lancaster. It's, it's between uh, right, it's between right Lowry's Lane and uh, Airedale Road. Uh, where is the your location? your property? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, on Lancaster Pike. You're on Lancaster. You right. Um, no, it backs up to Lancaster. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They're exiting on and, the county line. And the problem, the 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 neighbors that you said are not very sanguine about a sidewalk um, on from for your development are on county line or Lancaster or where are they uh, actually the ones that were the most upset about the Lancaster sidewalk are the are with the neighbors that were on Lancaster and the ones that were upset about a sidewalk are the ones on county line county line already has a sidewalk um, there already is a sidewalk a pretty wide sidewalk that's a good distance off the curb running up the other side. Um, so um, the people, um, I can't remember their names, but um, the lady that's on the corner up here um, on Lowry's and the gentleman that's down here um, that parks on one side of the stream and he's got to walk to the other side um, where his house is, um, he was complaining about you know, the Villanova students and how many people walk by there and their trash and all the normal stuff you guys have heard for the last 20 years, I'm sure. Um, the problem I have with an escrow account is it's just, I've, I've been in business for 40 years. 
I've done so many of these accounts, um, the money never gets spent. I mean, it just kind of sits there and then somebody finally says, well, let's, let's grab that money. I mean, I'd rather just spend the money on the project on something that you would choose to spend it on, um, you know, more trees, better buffers, something would benefit the neighbors rather than set up something that's really going to upset the neighbors later on. And if you want to do a sidewalk anywhere at any time, you have the right to assess the property owners. In, in your whole township. Right, I but believe. that's a whole different can of worms than, than doing it at the get-go. And if that's your, I mean, that's a legitimate concern that you've raised about it just sitting there because who knows if this will ever get developed. We don't know when those two properties change hands, we have no idea what those landowners are going to want. Um, and it, well, I, that, can, I can tell you any of these, I, I can't imagine any of these landowners right here with their, the fronts of their house facing the other direction or going to want a sidewalk in their backyard. I mean, I just... Well, as I understand it now, there's yeah. a makeshift sidewalk and that there's a path that people use. Not, not behind my property, there's not. On Lancaster, there's not a path? I went out and looked at it. I, I mean, I... And I've seen people walking there. Right. I mean, it's used now I've seen bit. it above, but where here. the bus stop is, up where the bus stop yeah, is. Yeah, I've seen it here, too. Down here, too? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I was but in any case, what I, what I was saying is if that's your concern, we could put um, some sort of time limit on it. You know, if this money isn't spent on a, this sidewalk in five years or ten years or whatever <coughs> number we came up with, then it could go towards landscaping or whatnot or uh, something to improve the site. Commissioner Schaefer, if mm -hmm. I may, mm -hmm. there are a number of residents here that I recognize from the neighborhood. It may be helpful for us to hear from them first before we go any further with these sure. conversations. Sure. I fully respect where you're taking that. Uh, Mr. Bentley, um, I also appreciate what you recommended that instead of sticking money into an account that may not do anyone any good, what I'm thinking is we'll probably hear from some of the residents that surround your parcel that will want to have more buffers planted and more protection you know, from the site. Uh, site view and whatnot. So there may be a hybrid here. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Yes. By the way, just to clarify, we already have given the neighbors, some of the neighbors are here tonight, we've given them additional buffers along their property mm -hmm. lines and we've actually moved houses away from their properties mm -hmm. um, so that they would have some more, some <clears> more room. And, um, but if you, if you drive down the street, our houses are going to look pretty much the same size lots and the same massing. We did a massing study of the existing uh, houses and it should be pretty similar to the houses at least on the Radnor side on the lower Marion side There are some larger houses that the lots are small, but they're they're wide and shallow Whereas on the Radnor side they go the uh, they're kind of shallow in the front mm -hmm. If you understand what, what I'm saying. Uh, Mr. Bent, what's the rationale for not having sidewalks within the development? Um, well We made a lot of compromises and we lost lots. Um, we added it. We originally had all cul-de-sacs, and and really what it was was a long negotiation with the planning commission and the neighbors. And um, originally we had uh, 12 driveways that all came out onto County Line Road, and the planning commission asked us to go back um, and do three things: to to be more creative with our traffic usage. Um, to make the neighbors happy, which was a pretty tall, tall order at that point. Neighbors on county line? Yes. Well, no, any neighbors. Um, we had more, actually more lower Marion neighbors come to our meetings mm -hmm. than Radnor meetings, than Radnor neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and also to uh, lose two lots. So we lost two lots. We had a lot of meetings with the, um, the neighbors. And uh, in the process, we ended up, we're now building a $300,000 cul-de-sac that is very short. <laughs> And the cost of that is going on to it. So what we asked for is in exchange for doing the cul-de-sac and eliminating the driveways, which would have been, you know, in this economy, the best thing for housing is to keep the price down. Um, we went with the cul-de-sac and we got reduced right of ways everywhere. So there really is not enough room for a sidewalk right now. It's really very tight. But, um, and we also figured that with the amount of traffic, amount of people, pedestrian traffic you're going to have on that cul-de-sac. The cul-de-sac is, is really, one of the reasons we were willing to do it is because it's kind of a neighborly feature. It adds a sense of neighborhood and a sense of place to the, um, 
to the community. I mean, originally, we just had a bunch of long driveways. So we did think that by doing it, we would get a little bit better value, but we wouldn't get you know, quite $300,000 value. It's, it's a long way to answer your question. Okay, I'm sorry. Sure Excuse me if I'm not so being. It's an economic problem for you. Well, it's economic and space. I mean, we, we had to try and keep everybody happy, the planning commission and neighbors. And the wider we make the cul-de-sac, the skinnier the houses get. Um, the closer they are to the neighbors. So what the neighbors really wanted, they want the houses to look nice, and they didn't want it to really be a big difference. So we made, you know, concessions to them trying to keep the houses, yeah. you know, a minimum size, and that size is about 50 feet, okay. which is pretty consistent with what the other houses are. All right, I have uh, just a few comments I'll make, but I, I really do want to hear from the neighbors because in the end here, I want to make sure that we can do the best we can to make them happy. So we may well, not make them all 100 percent. They happy. were happy at the last meeting. I don't know okay. if anything's changed. No, I'm not saying I'm not implying yeah, anything's changed, yeah, okay. I, but I have to hear from, from okay. myself. Yeah. But I just want to make a, a, a few questions. And maybe this goes to engineering. I can't tell by the contour lines on this drawing from what I'm looking at the screen. But is there is there any steep slope um, that uh, is in the path of that uh, lane that connects uh, lots six and seven? And um, can anyone describe to me what the sloping is on that? Well, there's no steep, prohibitive steep slope. Well, let, let, let me put it this okay. way. What is the slope of that lane? And I see Dave, Dave's going to take a look at that. One of the concerns I have is there are, there are several waivers here in terms of right of way. And we're also serving uh, two residences with a lane that's kind of deep into this property. And <clears throat> one of the concerns I had was the width of that lane um, and how it pertains to access for the fire departments. I want to make sure that the fire departments or the fire uh, marshal or anyone who can give us that advice is satisfied with this plan. Because one thing I learned is that the fire trucks can bottom out when there's a crown or a steep, any type of a slope. And the concern I have is that we're servicing these two homes, what I consider kind of an, somewhat of an inside lot, uh, off of a cul-de-sac that has a, you know, a smaller right of way. Um, yeah. I assume the cul-de-sac yeah. is to our code though. Yeah, actually John, there was a great deal of discussion of, I can save you some time. Sure, here. yeah. Uh, we had to do a, a I forget what the technical term is, but we did a, a plan of how a fire truck would come down there and turn around, and there was a lot of discussion about the width of the cul-de-sac. And actually, two of the members of the Planning Commission, I can't remember their names, but they sat on that side, asked us to make um, this section double wide so that there could two cars could pass there. So this, this area right here is 20 feet wide. I don't think this is any steeper than your ordinance allows, or else it, we would have had to have an ordinance uh, uh, waiver for it. Okay, Dave, do you yeah, want I mean, any comment? Commissioner, to, uh, I guess the driveway slope is approximately 10%, which is traversable by a fire truck. And, and the fire marshal has been involved in the review of this plan, and, and he did not foresee any issue uh, accessing either lot six or seven uh, with, a fire, with fire apparatus. Okay. At this point, I'd like to hear from some of the residents. I assumed everyone else. No, was I have finished. a couple of questions. No, I, just, I guess, Dave or Kevin, the sidewalks that he's asking for a waiver are currently required. Correct. Yes, the ordinance would require sidewalks. And the logic for waiving the sidewalks, I heard, is twofold: one, costs Tom more money, and two, the certain residents were opposed to it. Is that accurate? That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Well, sir, I, I will tell you, nobody really cared that it cost me money. Um, it, was I, I understand. it was really <laughs> about the, the neighbors. <laughs> right. But I had to save you money, too. Okay. Kevin, was your question about the interior sidewalks or the sidewalks on the two main arteries? All of them. I just think we're inconsistent in how we apply our rules, and I just wanted to understand. And so just to confirm that, Dave or Steve, the, our ordinance currently requires sidewalks for a development subdivision like this on County Line Road and Lancaster Avenue. That's, well, that, that is correct. Doesn't it also require it on the And, and also on the, the interior, on the because, interior road. Right, because it's asking for a waiver. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. So they requested a waiver on all three streets, and uh, the Planning Commission had made a recommendation 
to uh, accept that waiver. Yeah, I also I agree with Elaine's position. I think Sidewalk on Lancaster makes tremendous sense, and to not have that set up when we have the opportunity is fairly short-sighted. And it's, each time we get a development, we say we want a sidewalk, and they say, well, there's none on either side. Well, then the next guy comes in, and we don't get a sidewalk for him. And we never would have straightened up downtown Wayne if we had taken that attitude. So I'd like to see something, and this is a caucus, so we're not making decisions tonight. We're just discussing the project. So that's the only comment I have. Any other commissioner comment? All right, now we'll hear from the public. My name is John Devlin. I live at 1440 County Line Road. My parcel is right here. We do not want a sidewalk on Lancaster Avenue. Mr. Bentley has been eminently reasonable. He has listened. There are bona fide security reasons why we don't want sidewalks on Lancaster Avenue. We don't want to encourage pedestrian traffic on the north side of Lancaster Avenue because you neglect the fact there's a park, and I don't know the name of the park. Lancaster. Right. But there is no sidewalk traffic from that park. There is ample sidewalk traffic on the south side of Lancaster Avenue, more than ample traffic. There are security reasons why we do not want to encourage pedestrian traffic on the north side of Lancaster Avenue because unlike the south side of Lancaster Avenue, this is a heavily residential area. Across the street, there are the Radnor Arms Apartments. There is an apartment, the Radnor Plaza, the Rosemont Plaza, along with a certain commercial establishments, commercial office buildings, if I recall correctly. The sidewalk set off on the south side of Lancaster Avenue is designed to carry the pedestrian traffic from Villanova University into Bryn Mawr. We do not want to encourage, and there's been absolutely no discussion by anybody in this board who's have promoted or even discussed a sidewalk about the security issues this would present to the residents of this proposed area along with the other residents downstream. We want to preserve the residential character of this neighborhood. Seventy-five years ago, the homes were built without sidewalks. That has preserved the residential tone, if you will, of the area which Mr. Bentley seeks to preserve as well. There's no reason for any kind of sidewalk on the south side of County Line Road. Are you talking I'm talking County about Line right or, or Lancaster? I'm talking about County Line. I've concluded my discussion about Lancaster you, Avenue. You have complete. Now, I have. Could you re, you, your, your house is on County Line. My home is here. But your, your, the thrust of your argument is don't put a sidewalk on Lancaster. No, sir. The thrust of my argument is not only do we not want a sidewalk, on okay. County Line, excuse me, on Lancaster Avenue, we do not want a sidewalk on County Line. Oh, why we don't, don't, we don't want a sidewalk anywhere near here. Why, why is that? As I explained to you. You don't, you don't live on Lancaster. No, but I'm explaining, but I live in a neighborhood, and I can tell you something right now. I can look out here and see people on Lancaster Avenue and vice versa. This gentleman proposes to put some kind of a buffer here along with other trees, that's acceptable. But I don't want pedestrian traffic or people encouraged to start to enter into this area, which a sidewalk would do because a sidewalk would increase the number of pedestrians in the area. We don't want to encourage that. That's why we don't want that on Lancaster Avenue. For the same reasons we don't want that on county line, except on county line, 
My home was built in 1927. The people next to me, their Wallace Werner home was built in 1923. This is a Wallace Werner neighborhood. These homes were built 70, 80, 90 years ago without sidewalks. We don't want sidewalks on the south side, the Radnor Township side of County Line Road. First of all, the sidewalk traffic for the last 80 years has been eminently capable to be handled on the Lower Marion side, which is the north side of, Lank of County Line Road. Secondly, in reliance upon the longstanding history of this township and not placing sidewalks on County Line Road, many people, including myself, have very expensive trees, shrubbery, and other setbacks that we don't want disturbed by a sidewalk. There's no reason for a sidewalk here. There's absolutely no reason for a sidewalk. Yeah, and simply not, to say not... we need a sidewalk because we have an yeah. ordinance yeah. neglects the fact that we've been here first. And we don't want the neighborhood character of this area destroyed because somebody says we have a sidewalk ordinance, let's use a sidewalk. If this gentleman is willing to take 50000 or whatever he wants to spend, and there's something else, let's encourage him to do that. He has told us that the stone wall that's adjacent to Lancaster Avenue, which is important to the character of this area, will be preserved. Let's encourage that. Let's not bring pedestrian traffic where it's not warranted for safety reasons and for reasons to destroy the character of the area because we don't want to do anything to diminish the value of this residential area. I've been trying to sell this home for a long period of time. This is a very difficult market for anyone to sell a home in. How this gentleman wants to come in and sell 10 houses, that's great. I wish him well. But I can tell you, by increasing the pedestrian foot traffic in that area will have a deleterious effect on the value of our residential properties. And we ask you, do not do that. Uh, County Line Road has a sidewalk on the Lower Marine side. Yes, sir. Okay, so the only discussion... And, and let's, let's talk about that. Well, no, we're that not... means there's yeah. a sidewalk over here. Yeah. Yeah, There's I, no sidewalk here. Well, the, the board was asking a question about Lancaster. I don't think the board's pushing for a sidewalk on County Line Road. We're looking, well, at, we're, we're looking at Lancaster. We we'll don't want traffic on I know. Lancaster Avenue either. Yeah, I know. We're, so all I'm saying is we're not going to be probably discussing a sidewalk on County Line Road. It'll be Lancaster. No, but you yeah. invited public comment. I know. And it's yeah. a strong sentiment of this neighborhood. We do not want a sidewalk. And I've explained to you why we don't want a sidewalk. We don't want a sidewalk because of safety considerations and because of the fact there is already a well-networked sidewalk area. Mr. Devlin, any other concerns or issues that you have with the uh, proposal at this time? Because Bentley has served his own interests and the interests of the neighborhood well by listening to us. I think fault lies with the township in neglecting to rezone this before we even had this conversation. There's a lot of homes going into a very small area. It's registered R4. That was a gross deficiency in a part of this township and allowing that to occur, but that's the way it is, and we gotta deal with that. And these conversations we're having today about the sidewalks and about setbacks is incident to the fact we're putting 10 homes into an area that previously had one home. We were here first. We were here before Bentley was here. And therefore, we are highly concerned that the neighborhood character not be disturbed. That's why I'm standing up okay. responding to your question for neighborhood input. We don't want sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Barbara Welsh. I live at 1444 County Line Road, and we've lived in the township about 40 years, and our house is just on the other side of the Devlin's house. My concern uh, when I saw the Gilmore and Associates report was just how many waivers there are. Uh, the length of the cul-de-sac, the width of the bulb of the, the cul-de-sac, the width of the cul-de-sac, and I just wondered, uh, and, and even where the cul-de-sac um, 
exits onto County Line Road. It's, it should be 50 feet further away. And I just wonder, is it typical that all these waivers are given to a developer? Well, what, what they're trying to accomplish is there's going to be 12 houses here. So they, Ten. they want to, pardon Ten. me? Now, originally they could put 12 in there, but in meeting with the neighbors, they cut it down to 10 and it took a lot. Of, and so they made all these adjustments to try and make the best development they can. And that's what the Planning Commission discussed with the public. And that's what, you know, we can discuss with the public is that do you want the standard development or do you want something creative? If you're going to do something creative, work with the neighbors, then you're going to have to give these waivers. If you don't give these waivers, then you're not going to get this creative development. I think my real concern is, following up on what my neighbor, John Devlin, said, is our, our, my house was built in 1925. It's an old neighborhood, but it's uh, been beautifully preserved. We've all remodeled our kitchens, our bathrooms. We, we spend a lot of money maintaining our houses. So we have a very nice character in the neighborhood, and that includes our Lower Marion neighbors. And they're Wallace and Warner houses. They're really important architecturally. So we really want to be sure that the whole quality of our neighborhood is maintained. So that's my concern about cutting corners. If in the long run, then you don't just cheapen the whole neighborhood. My other question is about the private road. Is that typical that private roads are put in in developments? Is that pretty typical? They do occur. Uh, it's not something we encourage, but they do occur throughout development in the township. So, and it's said that it's a neighborhood development, so there are 10 houses, but three of those houses don't use the cul-de-sac, so are they still part of that private road? I'm sure, yeah, um, I mean, they're all going to have to maintain that, right? Yeah, I mean, some agree with every house, they're going to have to maintain that private road. Correct. I mean, prior to, this is a preliminary plan approval, Pro, prior to final plan approval, they'll have to submit a document which, which outlines how that road will be maintained. Uh, whether it would be seven of the ten units supporting that road or all ten, which I would submit most likely to be all ten units responsible for maintaining the, uh, the road itself as well as the stormwater management system. So that, that will be flushed out prior to the final plan approval. And Dave, as a private road, they're responsible for their own snow plowing, correct? Right. That would be correct, yes. And that snow. will be documented as well? Yes. And then my last question is just about some of these driveways that go through someone else's front yard. Uh, I, really, I really wonder how desirable that is. And this is one right here. So that, that house number seven is going to look out at least into a corner of the front yard with someone else's driveway. And then when you look at property number 10, it's got, it's got some trees in front of it, but it's still running in front of somebody else's front yard. Is that, is that a typical? Yeah. Development well, the good news plan. is you don't have to buy the house if you don't That's want right. that type of driveway. That's so right. you're not forced to accept it. I, I guess our concern as neighbors is that a development would be started and it wouldn't be completed. And then we would be looking at a half completed some holes in the ground. And that's, that's a big concern for us because we're going to have to live through this construction and we know it's going to go on for years. So that's that's Thank another you. concern. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. Any other comment? I just had a question for are you are you gonna do spec building or are you gonna build to order? You can't speak from the audience, you must come to the mic. What was the question? Are you gonna do spec building or are you gonna build to order? We'll probably do one spec and, and, and do the rest of build to order. We've we've got a huge amount of interest. Um, uh, we're trying to keep the prices, I know it sounds funny, but we're trying to keep them in the $800,000 range, which for a new home in Radnor Township is hard to come by. Okay. Any other commissioner comment? Oh, I just want to follow up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and there's more public comment. Right. I'll let the public comment finish and then okay. I'll say a few. Hello, I'm Maureen Devlin, and I live at 1440 County Line. You heard from my husband. Um, I just wanted to make it clear for those of you who may not be familiar with the neighborhood, and I got the indication that maybe somebody wasn't aware over there, that when you're on Lancaster Avenue, can you hear me if I move yep. a little? Well, no, you got to stay with the mic. You can pull the mic over. The mic. You can bend the mic over. There we go. Okay, so on Lancaster Avenue, 
uh, there is no sidewalk below the uh, proposed development. And there is no sidewalk above the proposed development. Now the path that I understood someone to identify over there occurs between a stone wall which is um, historical, has been there for goodness knows how many hundred years. And our neighbors that live down the bottom here talk about their property being a sheep and it has met much historical significance in, in the neighborhood. They'd have no sidewalk in front of their home. Um, and I know you're tired of hearing about this, but the fact is that these people up here have no, there's no access. And there is actually a bus stop that people use at that corner. And there's nothing below. And, and people that this intersection up here at Lowry's Lane has recently been lit like a Christmas tree so that people can cross from the north side of Lancaster Avenue where there are two sides. At Lowry's Lane, there are two, there are uh, sidewalks on both sides of the street. That intersection has been very well lit, made handicapped ac accessible, and now the south, and so that people can cross over to the south side and use the south side to access Bryn Mawr, where the, co the students are walking down to go to CVS, the AM, PM, they're, they're going down that, that side of the street. If you try and put a sidewalk on the opposite side, the, the proposed development side, I would like you to think about the safety aspects because it's not that wide. If you disturb that historical wall, which it's a wonderful idea to preserve that for the people that would be purchasing these homes in the back. It's like a nice screen. It provides a berm, and, and Mr. Bentley has talked about landscaping that berm. But if you disturb that wall, you're losing that space. And additionally, um, the traffic up and down. On the south side, there's a setback from the pavement, which makes it safe for pedestrians. But if you start to talk about putting a sidewalk, squeezing a sidewalk in there, I would worry about the safety of a pedestrian in that space. All right, let me understand this. When we started Airedale Road, we had the township property, mm -hmm. okay? And we could run a sidewalk there. If you wanted okay. to. Then what happens, where do we go from the township property? Here, there's a private landowner. Okay. And there's a wall there? No, okay, not so, yet. All right, so there could be a sidewalk there. It could fit. I don't, um, to be honest with you, I don't know okay. where that. Now, in, the, in front of this property, there's, a, there's already a wall there, and you can't put a normal sidewalk. It has to be a thinner sidewalk, like they have. Correct. Between. Would have to be not Shimoni, as wide. Shimoni Road and Lancaster Road, people keep complaining because there's a small sidewalk because there's a, a you, you know. Actually, okay. what it would be would be like uh, okay. finishing a path. Okay. Then when you, leave the, when you leave this property, going up to Lowry's Lane, are there stone walls? The stone wall stops. Stone wall stops. However. It's uphill. No, there is a continuation of some of the stone wall. It's, it's okay. broken, but there is a continuation. Yeah, but if you wanted to put a sidewalk further up, you would have to dig into the hit side of the hill to do and it. Stone, and more stone wall. And the people that live wall. quite at the corner of Lowry's and Lancaster have a very narrow uh, area between the stone wall and yeah. the actual street, the curb. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's not something that even if you started, it could be continued without going less than, okay. less than adequate width. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Any other public comment? Commissioner comment? I'll just, uh, I, I think this is a, a, a relatively good compromise, however, at least for me personally, I, I still feel that there's maybe one too many homes in this plan. And that's why we have to give relief for the right of way. That's why there's no room for sidewalks. That's, you know, if, if you think about all the things that we had to give up that we normally expect in our, in our proposed uh, development, uh, it's a result of putting, trying to put too many homes in too small of a space. But I do appreciate uh, the developer and the applicant coming in early and often with the neighbors and working with them um, I mean, at this point, I'm not really hearing much opposition to this plan. What I'm hearing is the concern, and I've heard it consistently, that no one that surrounds this property wants sidewalks. I get it. I'm not going to be pushing for sidewalks. Uh, I do think that because we uh, require sidewalks, um, that it would be fair to ask uh, that the, the value of those sidewalks be escrowed, but with some clear intent and 
clear uh, benefit, early benefit, not later, but when this project is progressing to have that done. I'm not quite sure what that's going to be. And I know there's some buffering that's been proposed in this drawing, but what I've seen in a lot of drawings in the last month is that, you know, we're, we see these trees put on the plan that are two and a half foot in caliber, you know, in height. And you know, were talking very small trees. What I would expect to see is specimens brought in that are large enough to completely shelter the neighbors from the site and the noise and the dirt, everything we can do to bolster that um, isolation there from the, from the project. <coughs> so, you know, my point of view is, I think, uh, to, to agree with uh, Commissioner Schaefer, Commissioner Higgins, that, you know, we require sidewalks. I think the money should be escrowed. However, I think the money should be better spent on providing adequate buffering between the existing neighbors, not buffering that will be good in 10 years, but something that will be good in the next 12 months. You know, not something we have to wait. You know, we, I don't want to have to, you know, see trees grow for the next 10 years until they're six foot tall or seven foot tall. They should start out that high. So whatever we can do to ensure that the neighbors are buffered and that they're happy and that they don't have to see, you know, the construction consistently through the project. If those trees can be put on in stages, maybe early and, and then later to finish up the buffering, that's great. Uh, so at this point, you know, I'm, I'm in support of this as it's proposed, but provided there's enough buffering done. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. I'd like to hear from... Well, I'm anxious to hear from staff before I make my final comment, so... One of the suggestions I can make in just hearing about the sidewalks in that is the potential of the park area that is there is to take the investment of $75,000 to enhance the park is not only a gateway, there's a gateway to the township, but also to this development into the neighborhood there. One is it's a neutral area there, so I think it would be a good investment here. Um, I understand the concerns with the sidewalks, which I think are very valid, but it would be a good way to invest into that gateway of the township. It's a park area. Everyone is has an advantage to that, and I think that would be an option for the commissioners to consider. Bob, let me respond to that. Uh, I agree. One of the issues I have with this is the pattern of development. We have essentially a new neighborhood being constructed here, and there are no sidewalks, internal or external. And the question is, how do people walk around? You know, are they walking in the cartway? And one of my concerns with the plan initially was, before the cul-de-sac, was that the, there was really no way to move around the site. But to Bob's point, is there any way to get access to that park? Because we essentially we're going to have 10 families, potential of 25, maybe 25 children living in that neighborhood, and they're landlocked. They're not going to be able to go down Lancaster. They're not going to be go, go down the County Line Road. They're not going to be able to get to the park. So what, what's in it? What's there for them? And I, I've seen this happen before where we create these islands. And what it forces is a, is a behavior of driving your kids everywhere. So I. I if you want to address that or respond to that. Well, I, I can't sit down when people are throwing around $75,000. Um, we'll put sidewalks in. I don't, you know, I don't, I, I really don't care. I, I'm just trying to make the planning commission happy and the neighbors happy. Okay, that's, that's my job is coming into your township as a developer, try and make everybody happy. And ultimately I have to sell homes. Um, that's, that's hard to do these days. Um, you know, the value of all the sidewalks in this whole property or maybe like $20,000, $25,000. So if you want sidewalks on a cul-de-sac, I'll put them on. I don't care. I mean, you know, we can do it if you think it's that important. I, I just, for this many homes, I just don't think they're ever going to be used. Somebody's going to have to plat shovel them and take care of them and everything else. I mean, with this many homes, the kids are going to be playing in the cul-de-sac. The only people coming in here are going to be the people who have the kids. Um, I've done so many communities with small cul-de-sacs. It's what everybody wants, and that's where all the kids play in the sidewalk, you know, in the uh, in the cul-de-sac. Um, and if somebody wants to walk down to the park, they're going to walk down the, the big sidewalk on the other side of the street. Um, what you know, other side of the street? On county, county line, county line road. There's a sidewalk on the other side, right here. On, on the lower Marion side. Yeah, right yes. Across, yeah, yeah. So a child that wants to go to Unkerford Park. Just crosses the Has street. to cross this county line road, which yeah. is a heavily traveled road. Well, they have to road. cross Airedale too. I mean, Airedale is much more dangerous than um, County Line Road. I mean, I don't that, think I don't think little kids are going. 
Pardon? They're, they're not talking about Lower Marion's Park. They're talking about Radnor's smaller park on the corner. I don't think anybody plays in there. No. I mean, no offense, but. Well, I think um, just to rest on my point, I, I think, again, escrowing some money. I'm not going to put a number to it yet. I think it's really up to you to come up with a proposal of what you think it would cost to sidewalk all of those areas. What, what I've heard the most from the neighbors is um, I will put, if, if it's the board's wishes for me to put sidewalks in, I'll put them in. What they've asked over and over again is for good buffers and good landscaping. And we think if you look at any of my communities, drive by Laurier on um, Bryn Mawr Avenue, you can't even see the homes. I mean, we do, we do very nice landscaping. If you want to make it better, I'll make it a little bit better. But we do a lot of landscaping. Commissioners, no on, argument. Commissioners, on the buffering issue, this project has not gotten out of Shade Tree Commission yet. Um, they've been tabled um, and extended month after month, um, waiting on the applicant to you know, address some things. So a lot of those buffering issues may be addressed from the Shade Tree Commission as they move forward through that project. And unfortunately, at this point, we're not quite sure what the recommendations are going to be coming out of Shade Tree. And, and I don't recall the detail, but this site had a, a large number of trees that I believe were cleared as part of the clearing permit. And, you know, maybe, maybe the additional work is planting uh, heritage-like trees along Lancaster to prevent, you know, to, to, I'm not talking large specimen, but, you know, trees that someday will be, you know, 75, 100, 125 feet tall will provide an enormous amount of shade you know, for the community. Yeah, we're, we're um, currently, we're at a pretty advanced stage with the Shade Tree Commission. Actually, they're changing their ordinance, so not to differ with you, but I, I, I think they're kind of waiting to decide how their ordinance is gonna change before they grant us an approval. Um, we are currently doing 145, give or take a few, replacement trees on the property. We surveyed every tree on the property. And as far as buffering goes, I have a lot of experience. My neighbors do not want to see Lancaster any more than the other neighbors do. You cannot have a shade tree and a good buffer in the same space. They fight, they kill each other. So good, good evergreens, good uh, firs, good um, you know, evergreens basically that are green all year long are the best, is the best buffer you can do. They grow great, they grow a couple feet a year. Um, we have a number of shade trees around the houses um, where they'll do some good and shade the houses. But we really, for the good of everybody, these are all, these are all pine trees and evergreens down here. Um, and that's, that's really will give you the best buffer. If you look at any of the communities we've done, we usually really hit them hard with the uh, evergreens along the roads. Um, so, uh, I would take exception that evergreen trees and deciduous trees don't mix well together because there are species that go together very well um, from, from that standpoint. Well, the Shade Tree Commission will look at that. Sure. There was, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. Lane, you have no, something to say? Go ahead. There was one other point that Commissioner Fisher brought up regarding the number of lots, and that was something that was brought up at several of the Planning Commission meetings. Um, one thing I heard tonight is that there was 12 lots and we went down to 10. Um, but we needed a waiver, and that 12 was buy right. Is that correct? Actually, the first plan we came in with was a, what we thought was a buy right plan with 16 lots on it, and we showed it uh, to the staff. We presented it to the planning commission also. And this is this is R4. I mean, if you look at R4, these these lots are three times the size of an R4 lot. The minimum size, the minimum size of an R R4 lot, I think, is six or seven thousand square feet. These average about 18,000 square feet. The size of the track doesn't guarantee you a yield from a development standpoint because there's other circumstances such as the configuration um, with the dual frontages. I don't know what that original plan looked like, but if you're taking access out onto either of those roads, you're in violation of the code and it wasn't by right. Okay. If but you needed just... a waiver to access County Line Road, it's not a by right plan. Kevin, Correct. just to, just to be clear, they believe they had a right a buy right by sixty, but we never accepted and agreed to that number. So is your point correct? Correct. And if they took access with a driveway out onto either road, it's not a buy right plan. And if they're requesting relief for a cul-de-sac on a smaller plan, I have a hard time believing that something with more lots on it was a buy right plan. 
but there was a possibility to put 12 houses here and we're down to 10. You can throw calculations up and divide an area by the minimum required lot area and say that you can get X number of homes, but when you actually lay it out with the minimum required lot width and driveways and roads, um, you know, generally it's less than that. Yeah, okay. So I mean, just, just to be clear, you, you have not made a judgment as to whether or not there's a two property concession being made here or not. Is that accurate? I was not involved. I was not here when, you know, okay. that was going through that process. Um, but I don't want you to get the impression that we had a buy right plan that was in front of us. Um, if they were taking access from County Line Road or from Lancaster Avenue with a driveway, our code clearly says that that is not requirement. They're asking for a waiver for that tonight. So that leads me to believe that it was not a buy right plan. Without seeing it, I don't know if the applicant has any sketches with him. Are we? Well, this is just a caucus. So I it is just. Caucus. Are we requiring traffic study on this? There was. I heard from numerous neighbors that there is the potential for stacking uh, on County Line down to Airedale uh, during rush hour. Um, and one of the concerns I had with these multiple curb cuts on County Line um, is that now we have, you know, four points of egress onto County Line. And if there is stacking, I would imagine it's going to present more issue. We also have a stop sign just west of this cul-de-sac uh, road. Um, and the question is, will this cul-de-sac require a stop sign? And if it doesn't, how does that work well with the existing configuration on County Line Road? Well, I mean, it, it will not require a stop sign. I mean, uh, you referenced there is a three-way stop at Orchard Way, uh, so, which is, I think, I think around uh, 275, 280 feet away from this proposed intersection. So traffic will already be coming to a complete stop and then having to accelerate as it approaches this intersection. So there's no, there's, there's nothing that drives a reason to have a, a three-way stop at this proposed intersection. I mean, our traffic engine, a traffic study is not warranted for development of this size, but our traffic engineers have taken a look at it and uh, there's, no, there's nothing that would uh, lead the warrant for a three-way stop sign at this proposed intersection. Any other commissioner comment? Well, I would just like to end off by saying, um, you know, it's, it's a dense plan with a lot of houses in a neighborhood that doesn't seem this dense. So that's, I feel, you know, that's what everyone is reacting to and what I react to when I see this. However, it's three and a half acres in, and it's zoned R4. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, I do feel, having watched all those meetings, that the process went well in terms of, of neighborhood interaction with the developer and responsiveness. Um, as far as the sidewalk issue goes, you know, this is a caucus. We'll continue these discussions. I may continue to maintain I would like that possibility out there. The whole reason we have this ordinance that requires sidewalks is because we as a community at large have determined that one of the things we want in Radnor Township is pedestrian walkability and connection between our parks and our institutions and our neighbors. You can't get that connection without pedestrian places for pedestrians to go. And if we don't keep at it over the years, over the decades, we'll never get that walkability that we want. It's in every plan we have. It's in the comp plan. It's in all of our open space plans, park plans. We want walkability. We want to connect our our parks. I mean, Uncafer is not a showpiece park, I admit it. It's a little piece of land, but it is a park and it's, it, it, it leads into another park. And um, if we want to promote that notion of, of making a pedestrian friendly township and community, we've got to, this board has to keep at it over the next decades. And every chance we get, we maintain, if we have an opportunity, we protect it. You know, right now, I can see and hear, we all can see and hear that there's no appetite for that, that um, sidewalk right now. But who knows what it's going to be like in five or ten years? We don't know. We don't know who the owners are going to be. We don't know what Villanova is going to look like. We don't know what's going to be going on in the other direction. And if we have the opportunity to preserve that possibility now, I think we should. Okay, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. It. 
All right, Don, you got uh, Sure. The next item is a motion to authorize RFPs for the Township Open Space Plan. Bob, do you want to have someone explain to us what this is? Sure. What we've, uh, we received a grant for this plan for the update. Uh, this would just give authorization for us when those bids are ready to be able to uh, put the bids out uh, for this service. Very good. So I motion we authorize RFPs for the Township Open Space Plan. Second. Commissioner comment? Public comment? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 7 to 0. Finance and audit? Thank you. I have, first up is the schedule of bills payable, disbursement list 2012-2B, the proposed payments of $1,252,607.18 have been reviewed by the respective department heads approved through the township purchase order process and then verified and processed by the finance department. The non-refund disbursements are within the 2012 budgetary limits by funds as set by the board of commissions, commissioners pursuant to the adoption of budget 2012. So I'll move to approve the schedule of bills payable 2012-2B. Second. Second. All right, raise your hand, whoever seconded. All right, John. John. Okay. We got the Johns. Commissioner, yeah. comment, questions, public comment, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Pass it 7 to 0. <clears throat> Next up, I have resolution 2012-29. The U.S. Department of Justice ESP Fund Creation, number 14. I don't know who wanna, wants to take this, but Bill, we'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, I will, I'll start and talk about the accounting. If there's any specific questions about the program itself, I think Mr. Calarulo would be perfect to answer those. Uh, this is a, um, a federal program, and uh, the agreement that the township signed to to participate with it has very specific accounting guidelines and internal controls that that we have to follow. Those internal controls include uh, not commingling <coughs> any proceeds of this program with any other funds of the township. Therefore, uh, the best way to achieve that and comply with that is to establish an entirely new fund within our general ledger that the proceeds will be deposited into. There'll be a separate bank account the expenditure and the controls associated with spending that money will all be within that fund. So we will very easily be able to uh, do the required reporting uh, and make sure that, or and be sure that any expenditures we make against the, uh, any proceeds we receive are in compliance with the program itself. And I'm referring to a, a 50 page <laughs> Uh, document from the federal government, from the U.S. Department of Justice, that uh, spells out all the rules and regulations of the program. Thank you. Chief, you want to add anything? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the uh, Traffic Safety Unit attended training, uh, drug interdiction training, with the DEA through the uh, Department of Justice. And based on that training, if they have any seizures regarding the drug interdiction through car stops or whatever the case may be, we would be able to share in any forfeiture money that is accumulated through that, and that is the reason for the separate fund. Thank you. Bill, this isn't a new program, right? It's been in existence for a while, right? This has been in existence for a while, but now we are participating. Before any, that, we were not participating. Any, I know you don't have the history. Do you have any speculation as to why we wouldn't have participated before? No, that's a good question. In fact, um, not so much with the traffic safety unit, but there was a uh, significant seizure uh, right, right when the township manager first started, where we were cut out of a significant amount of money, but since then we were we were taking steps to uh, adjust that and make sure that doesn't happen again. Any other question, other than the what I don't consider to be a significant, but other than the administrative burden of, of segregating the funds and tracking them, is there any other downside to participating? I, I see no downside. It's it's at no cost to the residents of the township. Uh, any, any seizures will be equitably shared with the township and the uh, Department of Justice. So in, any, in essence, oh, I'm sorry. In essence, they handle, the uh, uh, DEA and Department of Justice handle the seizure liquidation, and then in essence, we'll get some type of a, pro, like a revenue sharing check. Exactly. Yeah. If, if we are the ones that are responsible for the drug interdiction or we are working along with the uh, DEA. Okay, Do you have any kind of ballpark of what this could mean? Uh, it, it's hard to say, Commissioner. It depends on uh, what type of seizures, what type of hauls. 
Now, as you know, we also have that that is not associated with this, but we do have uh, some of our officers working with the uh, CID narcotics, and we are anticipating some money coming through forfeitures from that avenue as well. It could be a few thousand. It could be even more than that. Any other comment? Public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Pass the seven to zero. Who was the second on that? John. John. Okay. Nagel. John Nagel. Commissioner Nagel. Thank you. Uh, next up, resolution 2012-30. This is for a bond council, a bond council agreement with Cozen O'Connor. Uh, Bill White, would you like to discuss this? Sure. As summarized in the proposed legislation mem uh, memorandum, the township's 2007 bonds have a May 1, 2012 call date. Uh, with that call date approaching, uh, what we would like to do is similar to what we've done in the past, and I know I was here in 2010 where we refunded the bonds, uh, is to try to take advantage of the lower interest rates in the market to see if refunding these bonds makes sense. Uh, in order to do that, and make sure that we're complying with all the legal uh, parts of the agreement, bond counsel is necessary. Uh, what the township did back in 2010 in advance of that refunding was a, a search for bond counsel because the bond counsel previously had retired. Uh, so the township went through an exhaustive search and ultimately recommended Coase and O'Connor. Uh, they did a terrific job with the 2010 uh, so we are recommending once again to use them for this uh, proceedings if if the um, savings are such that it makes sense to move forward. All right, I'll move to adopt resolution 2012-30. Second. Bill. Morning, Cousin O'Connor is the bond council. You haven't done an, an analysis to indicate projected savings yet? Well, that maybe we'll touch on that with the next yeah. resolution. Yeah, and when, for now, when we make a second, why don't you raise your hand so that, you know, we get it easy. All right, there we go. All right. So, uh, Bill, in this, we, you can't would, tell uh, my voice, you're in trouble. we would pay them this fee regardless of whether we have savings? Well, if at, at some point we're going to make a decision uh, whether or not we move forward with the, the sale or not. Uh, so we will incur some costs up to that point. It will not be the full 19000 and change as proposed. We would only pay that if we went all the way through. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, at, what the cutoff point would be. But if, if we get to a point and interest rates change dramatically and we decide that this isn't something we want to proceed with, uh, we'll stop immediately. You're comfortable that we're going to see savings to justify this cost? Yes. And just in, if we are successful in the market and there are savings substantial enough to proceed with the refunding, the, this expense will be paid for out of those savings. It won't be a cost uh, that will that the general fund will have to pay for. And Bill, can I just um, clarify, if we go ahead and go down this road, which I, I mean, I think the savings, if the rates stay where they are now, they will be significant. Um, it, and with a call date of May 1, I mean, this is going to happen, start happening right away, right? I mean, we'll be start going out and testing the market and going to Moody's for rating like in March, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll be working. Well, again, I, next, well, ne that's the next. Let's item. jump right. to the next okay. resolution. Okay. <laughs> when, other, when's the second call date? Is it, does it get triggered May 1 or is it, or maybe you don't know the answer tonight. Is it an annual thing? I mean, it, I, I'm not sure if there is a second one. I, I, the documentation. It says the first call date in the, in the memo. So yeah. I, and I, I put that in there. I'm not sure if there's a second or any future call dates. Uh, we know that there's one now, though. Any public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Pass it 7 to 0. Next up, we have resolution 2012-31. This is uh, appointing uh, Boning and Scattergood Incorporated as an underwriter for this transaction of bond refunding. Uh, Mr. White, would you like to explain this? Sure. Uh, what we're proposing is to work directly with uh, with this underwriter as we step through the process of determining whether or not there are savings. Again, um, the, as indicated in the memorandum, the, the cost associated is only going to be incurred upon a transaction being done. The, the, the pay is at 0.650% 0 
of what is refunded. Uh, so only if monies are refunded. This is a slight change from how we did this in 2010. Uh, we're recommending that an underwriter offers two primary benefits, the first being flexibility. Uh, they'll have the ability to go into the market and negotiate with potential buyers uh, at various points in time. So, for example, if it's a Tuesday and the market is not favorable for a sale that day, uh, using an underwriter, we can delay the sale, push it back to Thursday, push it back to another time when, when the market is a little bit more favorable to sell. Uh, you don't necessarily have that flexibility when you do a, an, an auction date uh, because it has to be advertised and opened, and then you have the auction. If things go well, great, and that's what happened in 2010. Things went well enough when we, we were successful in saving what we wanted to. Um, but if, if for whatever reason we don't get the numbers we want, we're kind of stuck. Uh, so this does provide flexibility. And then the other primary benefit is it eliminates a layer of cost in the, in the process. Uh, well, we're not having to pay a financial advisor on top of an underwriter to buy and um, refund the bonds. And as it turned out in 2010, uh, this particular underwriter was the winning bid. So we had the uh, financial advisor uh, that we worked through, and we ultimately ended up using this firm anyway. So uh, my history uh, in dealing in doing these transactions has always been with a negotiated, a negotiated sale with an underwriter. Uh, according to the bond buyer, uh, bond buyer newspaper, uh, roughly 65 to 70 percent of these transactions across the country are done using a professional underwriter as opposed to doing uh, a financial advisor and bid. So we feel, we feel comfortable after meeting with the underwriter, talking with bond counsel, checking references, um, and reviewing other successful transactions that this is the best way to go. Okay. Can I have a motion? I'll move uh, to I, approve I, uh, Resolution 2012-31. I just have, can, I have a, can I have a second? I'll second it. I have another question, Bill. Did, did, are you guys prompting this, or did they come in and suggest this, or did somebody come in and suggest this? Well, we knew it was coming, and we had, okay. I, I probably have a dozen people that called up and said. It was in the CBFAC report. Yeah, I understand, but I just want to understand, because <clears throat> their underwriting fee is going to probably work out to be about three-quarters of a percent of an interest point. So, yeah, that's going to eat a chunk of your savings right there, and I'm looking at the 2.5%, so, I, you know, it depends on what we got sitting at the low end, how much we're going to save. Well, it, and we took that into consideration and included with the memorandum was a comparison of, of different underwriting fees uh, and felt pretty comfortable on where the, they came out at. And I'm, it was I'm similar not, to I'm the not questioning the fee at all. What I'm questioning is the fee on top of the low interest rate, if a lot of, our, or a lot of these bonds are sitting at the 2.5% rate, and I don't know what that, I haven't looked, your savings may not be all that much. If they're sitting at the 5%, they might be substantial. True. And how we'll proceed is, and this goes back to the question you had asked earlier in terms of if, we've have, if we have any projections. Uh, we were <coughs> provided with some projections. Uh, and what we did in 2003, and this is best practice, is to establish a floor. Uh, and generally speaking, when what we used in 2010 was a 3% net savings percentage. So that's after the discount, uh, the underwriter's discount's taken out. Uh, the total savings is somewhere between 450 and 560,000. Three percent falls somewhere in the middle of those two numbers. The day that we met um, and reviewed these numbers, the the market was such that it would have generated roughly 1.7 million. So we are uh, there's a pretty big window there, I understand, but that's the nature of the market. So uh, there are substantial amounts of savings potentially out there that that this could yield for the township. Any other questions? Public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 7 to 0. Next up, we have Resolution 2012 33, uh, adjusting the uh, fees for, oh, excuse me one second there, the uh, consolidated fee schedule, Chapter 162 fees for summer camp. Tammy Cohen, would you like to discuss this? Yes, I'll take that. Um, basically, this is a three part resolution um, with three fee amendments that are being proposed. Uh, the first one applies directly to the Radnor Day Camp program and then the other two to the Summer Tot Lot program. The first one for the Radnor Day Camp program is a new fee uh, for an, a, a, 
a proposed extended day program that we want to add. So this would be um, extended hours from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon hours uh, to address the needs that have been communicated to us or by parents over the years um, in a demand for having those extra hours within the program. So the proposed fee at $1,450 would basically cover all the associated direct, direct costs of the program for the staff, uh, the overhead and administration, the, the anticipated facilities fees, and the operating costs and supplies costs that we anticipate. Um, so that's the first one, which would be a new fee under that resolution. And the second, which I had mentioned, addresses the summer tot lot camp, uh, is essentially uh, taking the cost of the camp for the six-week program um, and raising it uh, $50, essentially, from $600 for the six weeks to $650, and then for the three, three weeks of the six-week six week program and taking it from $450 to $500. And that, that proposed fee is, of course, to, to cover the costs, the, all of the costs associated with the program, namely the understood uh, facilities fee that we anticipate with the program. So we, an, we ask for your consideration to pro, oppose, uh, to basically approve those fees so we can move forward in setting those what prices. What the hours of the extended day camp now be? 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, so it would be an Wait, What time does it open in the morning? 9 o'clock. So we're now providing a full day option a full day option with extended hours in the afternoon. Yeah, but that's you know that's essentially government subsidized daycare. Well, it's one thousand four hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> you don't have kids, Bill. Trust me, it, it costs a lot more to send your kids to a summer program than that. This is what it costs. Well, us. it's I don't know if government subsidized the right way. It, the fact that we're running it and not seeking a profit allows us to do it at that lower fee than compared to a for-profit enterprise that. Is that it fair? does, and, right. and when we compare yeah. ourselves to our our township neighbors, we're we're really in a higher we're in a higher bracket overall, just with yeah. regards to the cost of our camps. When we get into comparing ourselves to the private camps, that's where we become a little bit more comparable. But this it wasn't priced out based on any type of comparison relative to daycare I, I, fees. I'm just not sure we ought to be running a full day program. I mean, it's 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 one thing when people are you know are. are you know, ending at three o'clock, but all of a sudden, that's a, you know, we're now con offering competition to for-profit businesses in the area and subsidizing expenses people ought to have. I'll move to adopt resolution 2012-33. Second. Second. Raise your hand. Second. All right, we got it. Any other commissioner comments? Yeah, and Any? Bob, uh, your memo indicates, or the memo indicates that we're recovering the full cost, so I'm assuming that you're in support of this? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Any public comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes six to one. Next up, we have resolution 2012 32. Uh, this is adjusting the fee schedule concerning uh, the fees we charge organized teams and uh, participants in sports programs. Tammy Cohen? Any comments? Bill. Well, well. <laughs> administration is running away from this one. <laughs> oh, we're not running. Roy won't no, run away. I, I'm, I'm, not, ju I'm right. just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what we're uh, in light of some additional conversations that's taken place with uh, the school district and the community youth groups. What we're proposing at this time is to go ahead and repeal these fees as part of, uh, in light of a larger conversation, and what may happen with um, the school district and where they go. So. Uh, <clears throat> we're recommending at this time to repeal the fees in light of those further conversations. Um, can I say that I am thrilled that we're repealing this while we figure this all out, but I would like to, nobody's made a motion yet, right? Okay, no. so I would like to make a motion that we rescind or repeal only the youth fees. I don't see the reasoning behind um, changing the adult league or the for-profit groups because they didn't they had, we never changed their fee. They've always had that fee. No, so this isn't a new fee for you them. Understand what's but they, they also explained. have that fee, though, with the understanding that a lot of their play actually takes part in both, on both facilities, both school district facilities and at township facilities. So they whenever those the fees were orig originally right. conceived, it was based on that understanding. And for a lot of those groups, the majority of their usage does actually take place at the school district facilities. So they'll be paying for them as well as the fee that right. they've already paid here. But they've already... Ha they already have been paying that here. But 
the 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 bigger reason that I don't think it, the same reasoning applies to that those two groups, um, you know, the reason that we are having all of these discussions is because the youth sports groups, the little league, the soccer team, the um, lacrosse teams, at least in my opinion, serve a you know somewhat of a quasi government service. You know, something that we would be providing if they did not, or at least we would have the responsibility to provide for if they did not exist. I do not feel that way in any way, shape, or form for an adult league or a, or a for-profit sports organization that rents our fields. So I'm not sure that the discussion that we're having about um, the, you know, the indirect subsidy of these teams that we've traditionally had and now we're re-addressing, re yeah. it doesn't apply to those groups. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, I think we leave those be and we have this discussion about these groups that we have a responsibility to partner with because they're helping us, um, but we leave the for-profit out of it and we leave the adult leagues out of it. So well, that's my motion. Well, I have to abstain because I'm the expert on this. <laughs> but last year, we paid Radnor Township $2,750 for the use of the field Monday and Wednesday and $600 for lights. You're talking about your softball team. Yeah, and most of it was at the high school. Now, we're going to pay the high school $3,000 to use their fields and lights. We were paying the township to use Radnor High School fields. Okay? No, not true. Why would you even apply to the township if you're of all the uses no. at the high school? We paid $275 last year for... I'm that? talking about the under the current situation with the high school charging. Yes. You will deal right with the high school. You won't even deal with Radnor Township. That's right. We're dealing right with the high school. So this fee doesn't apply to you. What do you mean it doesn't apply to us? Because you're not coming through the township. Yes, we have to use Don and Clover. We're using Don and Clover oh. when the Little League's done. But we're using That's 25% of our use. And, you know, I propose... Well, one of the things, we're going to have a meeting with the subcommittee of the Parks and Rec Board and the facilities committee of the school district next week. And one of the topics on the table is fee sharing, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are going to fair, sh share fees. If you, char if you leave this in place, we won't have an adult softball league. You'll eliminate adult softball because we'll be paying you, we'll be paying you $3,000, you know, up to 20, and we'll be playing them, and it would just be too expensive. We won't have a, adult softball because you'll be charging us twice for what you charged us once last year for. That's the reason you're I, doing it. I think I agree with that sentiment. Uh, however, I'm a little concerned we're going to miss a window of opportunity here. If we normally collected these fees and we're going to now rescind these fees, I just want to make, I guess I want to hear from administration. Do we have a sense that we're going to at some point have this resolved in a window of time such that the fees will be effective or are we going to miss a season? My concern is we miss a season, we don't get to recover administrative costs. Well, I think is, is part of this here. I think we're, we're looking at rescinding this, and I understand the concern is waiving some and not waiving others. I think if you waive these, we're going we're gonna to hear that come back from the other groups, too, at the same time. So until there's a determination, too, and I think a lot of this comes down to the schools, uh, which they are discussing currently to see what their fees are, I think a lot of that will hinge upon when they make those decisions of how ours fall in line to that as well. Um, so I think as part of this is to kind of step back, and I think some of the uh, sports groups made some very valid points at Commissioner Nagel's meeting last week. So I think to listen and to be able to hear that out and see where the schools are going to end up at on this, I think allows us an opportunity to, to take a look at and see exactly where some of these impacts are between, you know, if they're using 60 or 80 percent of the time on school fields and 20 percent on ours, how do ours balance out to equal that? And then how do we compare in regards to what the school set fees for? So I think that'll be a, a lot of us to be able to take a look at this. So I think for us to take a step back and look at this into the considerations too of what the sports groups are, which I think they are a big part of this. And I think from the meeting that you know, Commissioner Nagel had, I think is a very good start for us to be able to step back and look and see how this all plays out over the next year. Um, then so we'll Bobby, able, are you we'll saying it's able, gonna take a year? I mean, well, I think as you actually go through this and see what the schools are, but I, I think a lot of this as we track time to see the actual usage and be able to track what that actual usage is, because right now we're guessing at how this is all going to stack itself up for us to be able to allow and come back to the Board of Commissioners, uh, 
hopefully in less than a year, but be able to come back to the board and say, here's what we actually have of how this is going to work. Because again, I think because of the grounds maintenance agreement that's not in place, but again, this is going to be a work in progress here, and I think we want to make sure that we get it right and make sure everybody understands what those impacts are of how this is going to factor out so that moving forward, we have a Bob, good idea where we're Bob, going to Bob, I just want, I, I know this is actually very complex. I recognize that. There's three moving parts, you know. I mean, the school district, the township, and then the independent teams. So it's very complex. My only concern here is that the school district basically decides they're going to charge certain fees at their next board, uh, you know, a supervisor's meeting. And then they impose the fees, they collect the fees, and then we're left after the fact. You know, I just want to make sure that if we rescind the current fees, that we can get them back in front of us as soon as possible so that we don't lose revenue. Well, they, they would all be retroactive. I don't know. I don't think that works well. I mean, once people are using your fields to go back to them and say, okay. oh, by the way, yeah, it was 500 bucks. I don't think that's going to work. Um, well, I just want to make sure the whole point, we worked really hard to get these fees in place over the years to help defray the cost of admin the administrative costs. Um, we know that it costs, you know, one point, uh, I'll say 1.6 or 7 million to, for the entire public uh, parks and rec department and all the maintenance of all the fields and all the maintenance of all the property we do. And we know that there's a couple hundred thousand dollars a year that we spend to maintain the fields. And we know that the administrative costs are a couple hundred thousand. Again, we worked, I think this board <coughs> took some lumps to try to get some of those fees in place to try to recover some of those costs. And we're going to repeal this. And I support that, assuming that we have in front of us, before we lose the season, a new fee schedule to enact so that you can, in fact, charge those fees. And, but so is the school district now charging them a fee? I think they're in the process of working through that, looking at all the different options. I think they're so going through Bill the same ha process. So how do you have a number of what the school district has Because they gave me approval to use their fields, and they told me they were going to charge me $20 a night for fields, $40, and $15 an hour for lights, $60. So I'm going to use their fields, which I use 75% of the time, I'm going to have to pay $100 a night. Right. But so they sounds like they've decided on their fees. They well, they haven't approved them, but I have. Right. They, they gave me their tenor fees so I could put my budget together, so that I have my budget. They together. have a schedule that they've put out there with all the different user groups and what they would pay for each type of field. It's, and so what they've given you, Bill, is it's not been approved. But in order for you to go out and sign people up, yeah, I have to have a budget you, to see right. whether I can afford to. You know, if they're going to charge me too much, then okay. softball would be done. And 75% of the uses, it's the same thing with this. I mean, I budgeted, okay, based on the school district fee, I budgeted $100 for the South Devon and, and uh, Clover, which we use in July and August when Little League's all, off of that. So, but, uh, but this $270 fee was based on me using the high school 75% of the time, not just using Donna and Clover. So right, the, well, the alternative to this, though, is that we don't actually rescind the fees. We actually collect the fees, and then we share no. those fees with the school district. No, we rescind so, the fees, and then, we, then we, we continue to work and come up with a system. All right, well, nobody seconded my motion. I'm going to withdraw it, and uh, wait, would somebody else like I'd to like make? to move that we enter, uh, adopt Resolution 2012-32, revising the consolidated fee schedule to eliminate these fees. Second. I have a couple it? questions, sure. yeah. Um, Bob, the driving force is largely the result of the meeting with the, the subcommittee meeting, and you heard feedback from largely the sports groups? That's correct. And is it the uncertainty of the number or the value of the number or both char just characterize the, the reason? I mean, what I'm, what I'm concerned by is you had a sound reason for proposing this in December, and now it's 60 days later and you're proposing to repeal it, so I want a sense of why you've changed your mind? I think because there's a component where, because of the grounds maintenance agreement, where the school district now has a big play in this. I think we're trying to work through that factor and then with the unknown of what that impact's going to be. I think it's the wise, wise, wise move, in my opinion, to be able to step back and see how this all factors out. Because again, you could have multiple fees hitting from not only the township, but also from the school districts that, again, may put some of these programs well. in jeopardy. Okay. So it's a lot of being able Hold to pull back. So I think, you know, it's okay 
what, what I believe is, you know, based on a lot of the information that's had, that's been given, and again, as the both entities work through the lack of the, you know, the absence of that grounds maintenance agreement, there's, a, there's big learning curves on both ends, and to be able to come up to what, what those impacts can, are going to be, I think it's a, a good decision for us okay. to kind of step okay. back and see how that goes. Thank you. Uh, so the, the approximate cost of this $45,000, that will be gone forever, or for this year we won't get that. And are you saying that you're going to revisit whether we should have a fee and we might establish it in the future? Well, I think this is something that uh, Commissioner Nagel's committee will continue to keep looking at. And so this doesn't say that in the fall programs that it doesn't come back. It's just, I think, a lot to determine of where, where the school district's going to go, where do we end up on this, and how that all the details okay, work so out. Y your opinion is that it's undetermined as to whether we will have a fee. That's, that's correct, to be seen. and I think that will be something okay. that I think Commissioner there, Nagel ought to... My third, my third item is, is there a concern that by us <coughs> repealing our fee, what we're doing is we're providing the school district the opportunity to provide a fee, and that essentially that, that they will get the fee instead of us, but we have actual, we have real costs also. That, that's one concern that I have, uh, so could you speak to Just that? from my perspective and not speak on behalf of the district, I don't think the district is looking to make fees off everything. I think what they want to do is look at, you know, their costs of what their costs are to operate, and they just want to be able to cover their, their expenses. I don't think they're looking at Right, but we said more these were that. our expenses. Correct. And now we're repealing them because, presumably, because they're pushing up against a level at which we are uncomfortable. That and, and now what I'm concerned is we're letting the other party in this put their fee in which, because they're being pushed up against a cost that's unreasonable, which will make it harder for us to <coughs> recover the fees that we had previously decided were necessary to operate our system. I, I don't think that's the case. I think what's looking at is the, the schools handling with, that handle their facilities and their costs and the township handling our facilities system and our costs and to get our hands wrapped around exactly where those, where those are going to be without a double impact to those organizations. So I think we're not looking at giving anything up except coming back to say here's what our costs are which we want to be able to recapture those costs so again this is one of those areas gray areas that this will be a first time in a long time that actually you've had the two entities having to deal with and sort out whose use of facilities and who's looking to re recapture just their costs but the the softball teams will pay a fee this year when the township permits us in the end of June beginning of July the township we will negotiate a fee with the township to pay for the use of those fields. I don't but think that's what this says if we rescind no, this, right? Well, they send it, but then you can add it on. Right. But, yeah. but Bob, but can I'm I just, paraphrase what, what you kind of, you, you, you kind of, right. at least the way I'm hearing you, you circled around it, but you wouldn't, you didn't choose the words I would, would have chosen. So I don't know if I'm not fully on the same page with you or something different is going on. What, what I think I, you're, you're getting at is the fact that our belief was that the township was covering an excess amount of costs on the maintenance of the school district's properties. And we based our fees here on the old agreement and the fact that we now have realized potentially township savings from not having to maintain those fields. These fees may not be reflective of that. Is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? That's part of it, but also, too, knowing the exacts of how these teams and leagues are going to participate, township fields, school district fields of where that split is going to go at that's something I think a lot of this we have to just kind of take a look and see where this is all going to go J J Kevin, help, me un help me understand that piece for a minute Kevin this is actually if you stop and think about it th this is more about the administrative cost than the right. fields maintenance cost because yeah, uh, yeah one thing and I think John makes a good point is this isn't maintenance costs these are administrative costs that we are talking about because there is no you know, we are not capturing those costs for maintenance and repair of those athletic fields. This is the administrative cost we are looking at, which is Tammy's department's time. So a lot of this is trying to factor out where that's going to go at and what the fees will be associated with that. This is not maintenance costs. But how does that change in light of the allocation of usage? Previously, the scheduling was all done through Tammy and her department with their staff, where now that is going to shift some over to the school district, where they will be actually doing some of that scheduling of time, which, again, knowing of how those splits are going to go here, is I think there's some points that have been made by the youth groups of not maybe not having all the detail that we have to be able to go forward <coughs> and do that, because there may be a change in time 
and how much time Tammy is putting into that and to be able to make sure we recapture those those costs for those programs. And I'm inclined to agree to this. But my, my biggest concern is probably along the lines of what Don and John have articulated is, you know, does this just essentially disappear after all the time and effort? I mean, I don't, I'm willing, I think, to to, to let the, the one year play out, but I, what I don't want is this to become just a tactic. No, the, I don't. I don't believe, at least from the administrative side, that this is going to disappear and go away forever. It's certainly yeah. not my intent or the folks in our committee's intent. It's to identify the proper charges and assess them accordingly. Okay, so it's. I mean, you're you're. What you're communicating is that you're the. You don't see the intent of this to permanently reduce the, eliminate the fee. It's that you believe that it is perhaps not consistent with the actual costs and that there's enough uncertainty. Now, and I'm, I'm sorry for if this, but did, is there a window that you think this would come back or is that still not clear? My hope would be sometime, John, maybe in the fall sports, so my guess would be probably in the next 90 days maybe to come back because a lot of details will be determined at that time in regards to the school grounds and moving forward. <laughs> Any other commissioner comment? Wait, wait I have a question. <clears throat> if, if there are programs that we administrate and we solely administrate, so for, I, and I'm, I apologize, I don't have enough grasp of this very complex web of usage, but I mean, if there are sports that are played on just our fields, why are we able to collect those fees? Are there examples of that or not? I would say the, the most heavy, heavily utilized um, organization in terms of township usage would be baseball, would be Red and Wayne Little League. And I, you know, I say that as a, a larger program that consists of softball and t-ball, where approximately 80 to 90 percent of the usage does take place on township grounds. And that, and that is covered right now under this, the field permitting fee, fee community youth sports, nonprofit organizations, the $10 per player, but, and maybe also. But we, the administrative costs, for the, they run their own programs. We, we just permit the fields and they schedule the fields. We're not in scheduling. Right, we don't schedule just, the fields. We don't we just permit talk to the, field the coaches all we or do. have any details yeah. in, in their inner workings of their program. No. We merely schedule the fields and permit the fields. Which okay, are so in the example, large block times. So, you know, Tank Anki, Anki Park, for example, you know, those requests are coming in large blocks based on weekday usage and weekend usage. So, but if you, if you look at the other sports organizations, their usage isn't exactly the same as what Little Leagues is in terms of the usage on our fields. So boys lacrosse and soccer, for example, is more of a 50-50 a on township versus school district land. And then girls that, lacrosse, that makes me a little bit more uncomfortable about agreeing to this at this point in time because what I think you just said is we're disproportionately affected by spring fees versus fall fees because of the, the high use on township fields in the spring relative to what happens in the fall. Well, I'm, I'm speaking that in terms of a full year of usage, so I'm taking into consideration fall as well. Yeah, hey, but if you say that 90% of the usage Do we have for numbers? Little League is on township property, okay. that means this disproportionately affects us versus 50% of it in the fall. No, it, it, that's taking their usage as a, as a whole out of the entire year. That's where I'm basing that percentage on. Yeah. So that includes fall ball, that inc includes yeah. any type of summer play, any type of tournament play over the summertime, and of course the spring program. All right, this is, um, this is a recommendation to staff. The sensitive majority board is we're going to pass. Does any member of the public have any comment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. All right, All right. Pass. three opposed? Yeah. All right, pass is four to three. <coughs> I abstain. It's three, three tie. So, a little more debate here. I, you know, I, I'm kind of on the, I have to admit, I'm Can on the I fence. I was at the meeting, I was at the meeting last week. I, I fully respect where we're headed here, but I, at the same time, um, we worked, we, we worked through these fees and, uh, 
No, there's two hundred seventy-five hour fee. I run the league. You should abstain. Right. Go ahead, John. Okay, so <clears throat> I don't want Bill to get in trouble. <clears throat> so I'm asking Excuse him to. Me. Before we before we go any further, um, I would like to have a motion to rescind the two fees, the ten dollars and the fifteen dollar fee. Well, Bill, Bill, hang on. You you don't need to do that right now. Just hang. Well, on. you know. No, no, I'm, tr I'm trying to work with you guys here. Yeah, well, we'll I just, here look, I just want to make sure we are juggling a lot of issues. We've had special meetings for stormwater, OPEB, retirement, all these things. I just want to make sure that this isn't one of these things, again, that we just kind of strip away and we can't get back to because we have a lot of other bigger issues that we're dealing with in terms of dollars. So well, I will support this. But I really need a good sense from administration that this will be a priority to work with the school district, with the board, with the school district, that we get there and we get some resolution to this. Because we really did take some political lumps on putting these fees in place. And I, 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 it seems silly to me to go through all that exercise for nothing. So as long as I have a good sense, and Bob's looking at me, <laughs> with lots of sincerity right now and I get a strong and and I don't see this as anything other than what it really is the fact that we ended a property uh, maintenance agreement with the school district and that what was all kind of tied into that was all this administration and shared use of facilities so I respect where this is coming from I just want to make sure that I'm being heard and that I definitely want to make sure that at some point the fee schedule comes back to the Board of Commissioners in this seat in this year and you know whatever we can fairly charge we fairly charge but I just want to make sure that we have the support of administration to do this what I don't want to see is that we do this and then we all especially administration you all juggle a lot of balls I hate to use that term but you're, we're all doing a lot of things and I'd hate to see this get kind of lost so as long as I'm seeing a lot of nodding and, and I, I have a lot of faith in staff, I'll support this. So I just wanted to say that. So if you want to put it to vote again, I can have another I'll motion. support it. Well, and one thing may just add to John. Yes, we will bring this back. And I know with Commissioner Nagel, his committee, he's already scheduled another meeting. So this is something we're going to keep working on. So this will be something that we will, as soon as it's ready to come back, we'll work through the committee and then we'll bring that back. But what's the, you know, as soon as? Monday. No, 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 no. When's it coming back? Well, there's another meeting that John has called for next Monday. <clears throat> so as soon as we work through this and with, and with the, working with the schools and the sports groups. When do we actually start charging them? Well, I mean, let's be realistic. This, when this originally passed, it was a four to three vote. Am, am I correct on that? I think, no. I think when we put this on, it was a... No, it does matter because I just want to let it so you go through this whole exercise, but this board, majority of the board still might not support this, an increased fee. Well, I don't know. I voted for it, and I thought if I didn't vote for it, it would have went down. So well, well, the fees are I already might change in, my mind. The fees are already in place, so the, the discussion tonight is to... Kevin, my Percent. goal is to have an answer that we, can, that we can take action on in time to support whatever the fall sports are. Well, John's indicated he's going to vote for it, so why don't you just call the motion and let him vote? Do we need to reintroduce? Uh, I don't think you do. I think John can just change his vote. Okay. Are there all those in favor? Aye. I abstain. <laughs> Passes. Four to two. Four to two with one abstention. All right. No further report under finance and audit. Okay, library. Nothing to report. Public health. We received a letter that um, our representative of the library board resigned, so we need to get yeah, new I volunteer. Discussed, I discussed that with Bob, and uh, we are going to have a vacancy on the library board to appoint someone in April. So if there's anyone interested in applying for the library board, please get your resume into the township manager. And that person is 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 not resigning from the library where she's resigning as the as the um, commissioner's appointee she's taking a regular appointment from the library public health no report old business i have a couple of questions steve on this february 22nd letter 
to regarding trees. Is the Radnor Conservancy contributing any money to the program? Uh, that program is funded by Chanticleer. So why is the Radnor Conservancy even mentioned in this letter? Uh, the Radnor Conservancy worked with Chanticleer. Uh, I know, you, like I said, my history on the subject is not uh, real deep. Right. But from what I understand, the Conservancy was in communication with Chanticleer about this project. and was one of the reasons why Chanticleer's donation was made to That's fund not, this project. Chanticleer has donated money to the township for many, many years. Right. Yes, and they also trees. stopped. And the they, fact they of the matter... They didn't stop. And let me finish, Radnor John. Conservancy donated $5,000 uh, in the past. John, you know, you're you just a shill for the Conservancy. John, uh, let him have Kevin, a, John, John, let uh, him have a say. There's four votes to uh, do whatever we need well, to do. Well, it's already done. It, the letter went out, I think. Well, then fine. The other question I'd like to understand is, it used to be a free program to the residents. The, you know, the residents would request the tree and it would be planted free. Who decided to charge the residents $35? The $35 fee was to uh, really try to get resident buy-in in the fact that if they put out a nominal fee, they would be more likely to continue to water it and nurture the tree through time as opposed to so there's that b resident buy-in. So that way, as opposed to a free tree where there might might be less incentive to do such. Did Chanticleer know that there was going to be a $35 fee associated with this when this letter went out? I do not know. So Chanticleer gave us $10,000 to plant trees. We are charging people $35, and we didn't ask them if that was okay. I don't know if that was communicated to them or not through the Conservancy. It was not communicated by me. Okay. Um, I just want to give a little history and context. The Conservancy kicked off this, the Big Tree program with a $5,000 donation, as I understand it. And their, as I understand it, their involvement now, um, there's a woman named Kimberly Donches who runs the Big Tree program, who has donated thousands of hours and gotten everyone at the table and gotten this program alive again and moving forward. And I think as a board and a township, we owe her in particular, and the Conservancy, but her in particular, a debt of gratitude for the work she has done in persevering through all of the politics and all of what it takes to get this type of project up and moving. Um, so I just want to put that out there. OK, any other old business? New business? Public participation. Hello, Jim Schneller. I live in St. David's, and I wanted to say something on behalf of myself, and also I think a lot of people who do use the park, uh, St. David's Park, for lack of, of the official name, uh, you may think it's a quiet place because when you're driving past at 35 or 40 miles an hour, you don't see anyone there. But there's been increasing attendance. It's appreciated by a lot of people, not only the playground, but people with pets, sunbathers, you name it. And we lost, within the past three months, a prize wisteria trellis about 75 to 95 feet in length. And it's quite apparent that what happened was the stanchions uh, rotted. Now, it's common knowledge that properly treated wood will not rot in eight years. So I wanted to ask you if you could look into charging the persons who installed that trellis to hold the wisteria, which was a prize plant and a treasure of many hundreds of people in St. David's, if you could possibly go after whoever installed that. Because it's clear to us that once the stanchions went, the Parks Department, who was, who was our Parks Commissioner? Uh, who, the committee person here. Can I ask? Bill, John. I'm just wondering, I'm ass we're assuming that the, uh, the stanchions rotted because two of them fell down. And the, <coughs> the department decided, well, it's best to re we don't want to start building something under a plant. And that would be very expensive. So if you could at least kindly go after whoever sold this wood that wasn't properly treated, uh, in the name of justice, in the name of, of you know, how the township handles 
vendors who give us poor mer merchandise. Thank you. Any other public comment? Motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Adjourn. John, you are.